So good evening, uh, uh, everyone. Good evening, Dr. Neerja. Good evening. Can we start? Or should we wait for some time? I think in another minute we can start, sir. So shall we start now? Uh, two minutes, we'll start. We'll wait for two minutes and we'll start.
So, good evening. Can we start now? Yes, sir. Uh, Pushpa, I'm also is joining. Uh, okay. She just wants, so I think we can start. All right. <clears throat> so, um, good evening, all of you. Uh, welcome to this wonderful event of Nobel Lecture Series on Nobel Prize. Uh, every year, there'll be six Nobel Prizes awarded for uh, the field of medicine, physics, chemistry, literature, economics, and peace. College of Pharmaceutical Sciences has taken this initiative to spread the importance of Nobel Prize on these topics for the year 2022. In this regard, today is the first session. We will have two lectures. They will highlight on the medicine, followed by physics. Before they begin, I would like to introduce about, uh, I'd like to speak a few things about Dhyanand Sagar University and College of Pharmaceutical Sciences. Dhyanand Sagar University was started in 1951 by Dr. Dayanan under the trust of Mahatma Gandhi. Dayanan Sagar Institutions has got several core subjects or programs, you can say engineering and technology, management, physics, chemistry, mathematics, life sciences, arts, designs and humanities, pharmaceutical sciences and physiotherapy. There are around 17,000 students in, under Dhyanand Sagar University. There are four campuses of Dhyanand Sagar University. One of the institute is College of Pharmaceutical Sciences. The College of Pharmaceutical Sciences has got several departments, such as pharmaceutical chemistry, pharmaceutics, pharmacology, pharmacognosy and pharmacy practice, the thematic areas of College of Pharmaceutical Sciences includes drug discovery and development, formulation and development, analytical methods, initial code drug design, artificial intelligence, and many. <clears throat> the research areas of College, College of Pharmaceutical Sciences includes pharmaceutical drug synthesis, medicinal chemistry, pharmacognosy and phytochemistry, novel drug delivery systems, drug delivery and drug targeting, QBD and optimization, Analysis and Bioanalytical Methods, Neuropharmacology and Pharmacy Practice. College of Pharmaceutical Sciences have received several research grants from Rajiv Gandhi University, VGST from Government of Karnataka, Sri Sai College of Ayurvedic Medicine, and Dayanand Sagar University itself encourages faculty and students through an indigenous research initiative called SEED Grant. So far, we have around 45 lakhs of research grants received for various research proposals of students and faculty members. This slide explains the research efforts. So far, we were able to get 17 patents, 10 are applied and seven are granted. More than 100 research publications are published in reputed journals. More than 45 poster presentations are you know, uh, done at conferences. <clears throat> more than 10 research, con more than 10 conferences and seminars were organized and seven books were published by the faculty. We have several industrial alliances. These are the, some of the salient uh, you know, industries where we have collaborations with them. Several research initiatives are uh, happening with them. Some of them are Ames University, Sri Sai College of Ayurvedic Medical Sciences, Radiant Research Science, Invivo Biosciences, Sun Biologicals, IDBR, Group Pharmaceuticals, etc. Our students, B farm students, M farm students, and family students are being recruited by 
many pharmaceutical industries, namely GST, GSK, Strides, Arcola, Himalaya, Indigeet, Novo Nordisk, Paraxil, Lily, IQVIA, Syngin, and Myla. So this gives you a glimpse of the vibrant research ecosystems which is available in College of Pharmaceutical Sciences. All these ecosystems are oriented towards drug discovery and development. In addition to this research initiatives towards drug discovery and development, we have an excellent pharmacy department who, in collaboration with Sagar Hospitals and CDC, they have been working towards for the betterment of healthcare and uh, uh, patient care. So with this, I, I conclude my opening remarks speaking about a few information about Dayanand Sagar University and College of Pharmaceutical Sciences. Thank you and welcome for this innovative lecture series on Nobel Prizes 2022. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so after this informative uh, talk about our College of Pharmaceutical Sciences and Dayanand Sagar University from Dr. N. M. Raghavendra, I would like to welcome you all for the first session on the Nobel Prize Lecture Series, which College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Dayanand Sagar University is conducting. So as we all know that Nobel Prizes are given in six different disciplines each year. So we will be taking two, dis two such disciplines for three next three weeks uh, on each Friday. So each Friday we will be having two sessions. So today we are going to begin with medicine and physics as our uh, initial first week, uh, top, uh, first week uh, categories for the Nobel Prizes. So the, uh, the first session of the day is on Physiology or Medicine Nobel Science, which, has, uh, which is awarded to Savante Pabo for the research on the extinct hominid genomes and evolution of humans. So the, uh, to elaborate on this topic and the research which is happening in the field, we have a very uh, knowledgeable speaker with us, Dr. Nirija Reddy Maleda. Dr. Nirija is working as a genetic counselor at Apollo Hospitals, Navi Mumbai, and genetic counselor at Map My Genome, Hyderabad, Andhra Pradesh. She is a board certified by American Board of Genetic Counseling. It is a leading, gen leading genetic counseling and education in genetic counseling. So she completed her master's in science, genetic counseling at Brandeis University. And her core skills involve genetic counseling, telegenetics, counseling, psychology, genetics, molecular biology, data analysis, DNA extraction and molecular genetics. So as you can see from the profile, she is the very uh, apt person to give a talk on the topic which has won a Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2022. So I, with this, I welcome Dr. Neeruja Reddy. And to the audience, I would say that if you have any queries or questions, you please put it in the chat box below. By the end of the session of Dr. Neeruja's, we will be taking it up uh, after the session ends for her. Okay, so uh, whatever query or whatever you want to ask her, please put it in the chat boxes. With this, I welcome you, Dr. Neeruja, and I will hand over the session to you. Thank you, Sonal. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, and thank you uh, for the Anand Sagar University for giving me this platform uh, today. Can you, Sonal, can you please confirm if you can hear me and see me okay? Yeah, I can hear you, uh, but slides, I think you have to share still, right? I will just share it now. I think your screen was on share. I wasn't able to do that. <clears throat> uh, I think we can pin Dr. Neeraja. Yeah. Just to answer. All right, so while this pops up, uh, like Sonal has introduced now, uh, our topic for the day is about, uh, you know, the Nobel Peace Prize, Nobel Prize on genomics and especially in, in uh, physiology and medicine. So this was given to a great researcher, 
uh, Dr. Pablo and his research has been quite inspiring, honestly. Um, and it really brings to the forefront uh, the, the benefit of genomics and how genomics can actually help us, um, you know, understand who we are and where we come from and how this has really revolutionized science, healthcare, medicine, and human beings. Um, so today I'm going to tell you the story of the extinct DNA. Um, so just to begin with a very quick fun fact, and you guys can use the chat box to put in the information about this. So what percentage of DNA do you think that you share with each of these? The rhesus monkey, the banana, and the chimpanzee. Do you guys want to take guesses? So I believe... Uh, Dr. Neerja, have you started sharing your Everybody. Slides? Yeah, yeah. Um, Not visible? No. Okay, I'll try. It's already on a share mode. One second. <clears throat> Are you able to see my screen? Oh, no, we are seeing a screen broadcast and stop broadcast, like that kind of a thing in the center. That Zoom link is still okay. continuously going round and round. Maybe perhaps you can stop sharing and try okay. and see. Can you see it now? I've restarted. No. Yeah, I did not. that. Are you able to see it now? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Let me just uh, share it. Okay. Sorry. It's still the same message coming, screen broadcast. Not sure what's happening. Okay, just give me one minute. I'll just start this yeah, on yeah. another device as well so I can share my screen. Um, just, sorry about this. Or perhaps you can share the PPT and we'll share it for you. So oh, I can do that too. Okay, I think I should be able to share screen now. Yeah, no. The screen, I think you have to be able to share. Yeah. And now it will come, I think. All right. I think you should be able to see this now. It's visible. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> all right. So I'm going to go back to what we were just discussing, which is that, <clears throat> you know, when we think about uh, what percentage of DNA do we think that we share with each of these organisms? So, of course, banana is going to be the least and the chimpanzee is going to be the maximum. But did you know that we actually share 50% of our genetic information with a banana, which is unimaginable. I mean, think about it. It's a banana versus a human being. 
Uh, rhesus monkey is about 98.5% and chimpanzee is about 99%. So of course, uh, you, you see that there are so much genetic information that is common between all organisms, you know, in, in, the, in the world uh, on earth. Now, this great scientist, Dr. Pablo, uh, was really interested. So he's a geneticist and he was really interested in uh, entomology and how the evolution of humans happened since he was a young uh, child. And so he started researching in genomics and then went into archaeology and learned more about human evolution. And his uh, award into 2022 for the Nobel Prize was because he was able to sequence the, our closest uh, relative, which is a Neanderthal and a species of humans that you know ex essentially existed 30,000 years ago. And he also discovered a new species of humans called Desisova, Denisova, which none of us knew about. So they actually are also one of our relatives and there has been a lot of inbreeding between the Homo sapiens and all of these species. Um, now you can imagine that this is, you know, obviously been a technological feat because uh, the DNA that they were really looking at was very old and was obviously something that was digged up, right? So let's go back and learn a little bit of genetics and then come back and look at what Dr. Pablo did. So if you all go back to your high school <coughs> and look at the genetic information and try to understand what this all means. Um, so how I view genetics is really as a book, right? So your genetic information can be thought of like a book, which we refer to as the genome. And this genome actually has 46 chapters. So these chapters we refer to as our chromosome. So if you open up these chromosomes, you essentially, all of these chapters have multiple pages, which is your genes and the letters, your DNA, right? So the analog to that is your human cell, right? The human cell, which we have trillions and trillions of these cells, that, that is essentially what makes up your body, right? So these trillions of little tiny cells that you cannot even see with your naked eye, so you need a microscope to see one single cell has a structure called nucleus. Inside that nucleus, you have your genetic material. That genetic material is essentially packed in structures called chromosomes. And if you were to unwind your entire genetic information, if you were to unwind one chromosome and completely unwind the entire set of human chromosomes, all the 46 chromosomes, put all of your genetic information, they say that you can go around the earth once. So that is how much genetic information is actually put together in one single step. So it's quite inspiring and it's amazing to see how nature works and how all of this information is packed together. And when you open up all of this genetic information, your entire genetic information is then merely written by four letters, which is the A, T, E, C, H, G. So just like you have 26 alphabets in English, you only have four alphabets in genetics. And the four alphabets in various permutations and combinations is what makes us who we are. So we have 3 billion base pairs, 3 billion of these letters in every single cell, right? So and then we have trillions of cells. So you can imagine the number of these, uh, you know, DNA units that we have, right? So we have 25,000 genes and that's what we know today. Of course, we're still discovering more and more genes. So gene is nothing but a small unit or a functioning unit of your genetic information, right? Now let's assume this is your genetic information and it's, you know, a combination of these four letters, right? Simple. Uh, <clears throat> now you see that, you know, the, the letter T has changed to letter C. And these we refer to as single nucleotide polymorphisms or we call it as SNPs. And so we have billions of these SNPs in our body. And this is exactly what makes you unique from the rest of us. This is why Johnny Liver is Johnny Liver and the rest of us are who we are. If these genetic changes did not exist, if these SNPs did not exist, we all would be clones of each other, right? The fact that these, you know, these SNPs, these genetic changes exist is why evolution happened in the first place. So let's go back to Dr. Pablo's experiment. So what Dr. Pablo was really interested to do was he was wondering, okay, what is the difference between the previous human species versus us and what made us survive versus they got extinct, right? And of course, there were environmental changes and there was movement out of Africa. So there was Eurasia, which had different environments and heat and lack of food and a lot of travels. So obviously, there is some mortality associated with that. 
but clearly there has been some you know um, nature's uh, play here because the survival of the fittest is what works and that's what mental said correct so let's to take a look at what they did so this is really a technological advancement and innovation really in a way because of what they have done so it's not easy to take out dna from a cell right first you can't even see it if it's only could i so you have to rely on chemicals and various experiments for you to be able to you know pull out some amount of dna from a normal human blood cell let's say and believe me we have failures in that so let alone what dr pavlo did which was dig up the earth find a tiny piece of bone in fact the bone that they had was a little fragment of the little pinky finger it was a very tiny fragment of the pinky finger so very small amount of a dna structure uh, that they can pull out now since these are bones that have been you know in the earth for over 30000 40000 years of course there are chemical modification that happens to your dna over a period of time plus you have to account for the fact that there is a lot of contamination uh, virus fungi bacteria all of this are going to be mixed with your sample so you are never going to have a sterile dna that you will get from as you would in most likely a human sample that you take in the clinic now what they did was taking out a nuclear dna which is the dna that is in the cell is is a little tiny amount from that small bone structure that they found so they were very smart what they said is they are going to instead try and uh, find the mitochondrial dna so mitochondria is nothing but the powerhouse of our cell and these are structures that is essentially what helps us cells function and gives us the energy overall in our system so <clears throat> the mitochondria has their own set of genomic information which is a very small fraction of the entire genetic information that we have but we have multiple mitochondria in every cell so they were very smart they said instead of going after the nuclear dna which is a very small quantity that we will get let's try and accumulate the mitochondrial dna instead right <clears throat> and when they did that they had multiple mitochondrial cells and they were actually able to get little amount of dna that they were able to work from so why was this important why was it important for us to take our dna from a piece of bone that has been lying on us for so long so one it helps us to understand our origin complexity of evolution which is very important we are still learning how humans have evolved from chimpanzees and how are we different and on the way we have discovered new species now we did not knew about know about that humans had uh it helps us understand genetic changes that have helped us adapt to various influences whether it's environmental disease um or even uh you know just migration it gives us knowledge about responses of our body and gene function so one of the couple of things that came out of dr pablo's recent research has been uh some of these you know snips that i talked about so the single nucleotide polymorphisms that are rk still on our system that actually originates from the neanderthals time and in fact they give us an advantage so there's a tibetan population that has an etsa1 gene variant which gives them an higher advantage of having high oxygen levels even in very high altitudes which is of course a way of adapting to the environment they live in this is actually an archaic type of dna that we have this has not changed over these many years of evolution similar to that they have also found that there was some archaic types of genetic changes that actually gave us advantage over an immune response um so this information is really helpful for us to understand how we change and adapt to our various um changing environments along with that how does this help us you know figure out um you know what kind of medications or treatments would work for us right so this is essentially what they found they found that there is this new species species called Den Denisova which we were not aware about so far they are little farly more related than our current species which is homo sapiens and our closest relative is a neanderthal which has been confirmed genetically now now let's talk about genetics evolution so we have talked about the human evolution now let's talk about genetics evolution so let's go back to our codes right so what do we know about our genetic evolution 1865 is when uh, you know mental had first talked about hereditary factors and the the p uh, you know experiment that has happened and there were a lot of discoveries since then so 1869 uh, you know frederick maisher had the first one who had extracted 
uh, you know, discovered the DNA from this white blood cell that he had extracted. And then since then, you know, a lot of people attempted to understand what these nucleotides were. Um, the, the term nuclei had been framed. And then Rosalind Franklin, which I think very few people talk about, was actually one of the first person who, who had extracted the DNA structure. And then, um, you know, she unfortunately was never in the limelight until recently. Watson and Crick were the, the scientists, the team of scientists who in 1953 discovered the first time the double helix structure and the model and in fact were Nobel Prize winners back then. Um, so this has been the greatest discovery of human evolution. Um, human evolution has taken millions and millions of years, but um, from, you know, in less than 100 years, we actually knew about the structure of the DNA. And since then, there has been no looking back for us. So 1990 is when the Human Genome Project initiation happened. 2001 is when they had first completed their Human Genome Project. And then the, the initial, uh, you know, um, uh, publication has been uh, provided. Uh, since then, there has been so many new projects that have come in. The Thousand Genome Project has come in. There is a there is an RNA genomics project that has happened, and there is really no looking back for us. So the the um, the Human Genome Project that, in fact, I'm sorry, this is going somewhere else. So the Human Genome Project that actually took us, uh, you know, a few years to actually complete uh, since then to today, we are actually able to finish, uh, you know, sequence our genetic information in nearly a few days, which is a miracle. Um, and of course the scientific feat. So since the Human Genome Project has been completed, what have we done? So we understood that when we were able to look at our reference genetic information, that the, the DNA, when you open up the entire genetic information and, and the genetic DNA that is existing, uh, we are actually able to uh, identify that there are certain genetic changes that are present. And because of those genetic changes, we know that these can be associated with various diseases. So an example here, the sentence, the cat ran down the ball is actually changed to the cat ran down the ball, which, you know, obviously does not make sense. And we know that this affects the way the gene functions. So since the identification of the genetic information, there has been various experiments to um, take a deeper look at the genome. So this is the karyotyping, which is essentially the first genetic test that was ever invented. And here we are looking at all the 46 chromosomes, and this is called the G-banding karyotyping, which is a type of a stain that we use. And this helps us understand various um, you know, numbers of chromosomes. So they, the scientists were able to numerically and, and systemically arrange these chromosomes in an order, and it helps us understand if there are any changes in an individual's genetic information. Since then, we have now been able to extract DNA, um, you know, make huge uh, libraries of DNA, sequence this information, and understand this at a very automated level and a fast pace, which helps us, you know, obviously uh, identify genetic conditions within a few days. So a decade back, you know, anybody who had a genetic condition used to take years and some, some cases didn't even know what their genetic mutation or the genetic change was that was associated with their disease. And this I'm just talking about 10 years back. Till today where, you know, somebody has a suspected genetic diagnosis within about three to four weeks, they would actually know what the, the genetic change was and because of which they have the genetic condition. So you can imagine how how beneficial this can be in the applications of medicine and, and, and pharmacy. Um, <clears throat> so when you think about genetic information and, and how they are related to various diseases, uh, there are conditions that we refer to as monogenic, which are conditions where because of one particular genetic change, there is a disease. For example, sexual cell anemia, thalassemia, which are common disorders we hear about. Um, and then you have polygenic uh, disorders, which means there are multiple small SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms or changes that leads to these, you know, uh, uh, conditions that are multifactorial in nature, so obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, etc. So this is a list of chronic conditions that we all see in our day-to-day -day lives, and we know that these are associated with various types of, you know, genetic uh, changes, but also environmental factors, lifestyle factors, your own dietary factors that play a huge role. 
so all of this has enabled us to do so much more than just understanding the basic um, nature of the disease it helps us also prevent these conditions and reduce the risk of developing these conditions in the future generation so prenatal genetic testing which essentially helps us reduce the risk of developing this condition in the next pregnancy and or at least for the parents to know whether the child will be affected and plan accordingly IVF has been another huge invention in our lives which has allowed couples who cannot have babies naturally um, and allowed them to have children and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is a procedure that is a part of the IVF which is where we can actually test the embryo before it's even implanted in the mother for a pregnancy. So in fact, our embryos, which are just a few cells big, so it's about 16 to 18 cells large. And that is when you can pretty much test that particular embryo to know if there is a genetic change. And only if that test comes back negative, they go ahead and implant those changes, those embryos uh, for a pregnancy. All of this has led to, of course, treatments of genetic conditions. So two you know, commonly conditioned, common uh, medications you'll need to hear about, the Spindraza, which has been a reform in genetic medicine. This is the medications you might have read in the newspaper, which causes about 16 crores. In India, uh, this is given to a particular type of a, a disease called spinal muscular atrophy, which can be quite fatal in young babies. Um, and so this medication has really shown huge efficiency and efficacy for the, for the kids, very good improvement and, um, you know, development for children. Uh, PAP inhibitors is again a common group of medications that has been identified, which is for individuals who have a particular genetic change and have cancers because of those. And this has again been a huge, uh, you know, game changer in chemotherapy medications because it has very good efficiency with very low toxicity. Um, so from all of that, and then going back, uh, you know, our genetics has obviously helped us to really map our ancestry. So of course, this whole story links back to the evolution. We try and understand, and I think as humans, we're always curious about where do we come from, right? And, and who are we? And that is the reason why genomics has been really helpful. It helps us understand how much part of our genetic information belongs to which part of of the world and this is really revolutionized the way people see ourselves and healthcare. so genetics has written our code but now we rewrite our own stories so genetics has found us a way where you know human evolution has led us to be smart enough and evolved enough to understand what makes us who we are and what makes us uh, you know what makes up our genetic code and what makes up our entire uh, information but and now that has led us to go back and look at how did we get here and we want to rewrite our story in a way that uh, we understand it completely with scientific evidence and this has been a great journey so dr pablo's research obviously has shown us great paths and has given birth to what is referred to now as paleogenomics which means paleontology research and genetics both together and this new field is going to bring in new frontiers and i hope that more and more research also provides more information in an ongoing genetics uh, research and medicine and hopefully this this can help us understand who we really are and what you know we we can do so here's us going back to our evolution and hopefully that story helps us bring up more information that can only make us more smarter, sustainable, and kinder human beings. Thank you. That's all I had for today. And I hope this was insightful. And uh, feel free to ask any questions in the chat box. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Neerja. It was a very informative session for all of us, I believe. This information about Denisova is the first thing, first time we are hearing about it, something between the Homo sapiens and Neanderthalis. So it's an interesting fact which you have shared with us. I okay. invite people, if they have any question, please ask in the chat box or question and answer. Or if you want to speak, maybe you can raise your hand and we can unmute you. Anything is fine, whatever you feel like. So the conditions. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. One question is what is uh, monosomy? 
So monosomy essentially is that you have you know one copy of a gene or chromosome. So conditions that are monogenic essentially means that one small genetic change is enough for us to develop a uh, you know a genetic <coughs> disease. So an example of that like thalassemia, wherein we know that if you have one you know one gene and the gene has genetic changes, and that is enough for you to develop a particular condition. Okay. Since nobody else is there, Dr. can I? Dr. Nirja, I have a question. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yes. um, it may not be related to this noble topic, but it's related to genomics. How do you throw light on gene gene therapy, particularly to oncology? Like, what type of gene therapy can have uh, beneficial effects in addition to the uh, uh, conventional uh, allopathic medicine therapy? Yeah. So the one of the conditions that we just talked about, the PARP inhibitors that I had shown you, is actually a form of gene therapy. So inhibitors are essentially they discovered that there are two genes called BRCA one and two, and these two genes are oh, are uh, genetics, you know, genetic changes that increase your risk of developing inherited forms of breast and ovarian cancer. Now, in this people, when they looked at the pathway, they saw they saw that there is a a, a PARP wherein if that PARP inhibitor is not existing, then it is not able to actually alter the function of the BRCA. So BRCA is nothing but a tumor suppressor gene. So its ideal function is to suppress a tumor that grows in your body. Now, when the function is not proper, it is unable to suppress a tumor that leads to the possibility of developing a cancer. So this PARP inhibitor, essentially what it does, it only attacks the cells that has the, the BRC1 and 2 change and essentially just kills those cells. It does not affect your normal cells, which does not have the mutation in the uh, BRCA1 and 2 gene chain. So this becomes very helpful because this mainly attacks your cancer-related cells alone as compared to what chemotherapy does, which is essentially, um, you know, systemic toxicity, right? So it's trying to just reduce the number of cells and, and slow down the process of division, which attacks every single cell of your body. So it's going to be systemic. As compared to what PARP inhibitor does, it's more efficient. It's more the efficiency is much higher. So this is one way where in oncology, especially that the treatments have really been helpful because the efficiency starts to go up. And now with tumor profiling, the liquid tumor profiling, there's so much going in genomics. We can now actually we don't even need to do take out a part of your tumor and then take out DNA from it. We have the capacity capabilities to just take your normal blood sample and then isolate the the tumor cells from your blood sample and then take out DNA from it. So imagine the number of biopsies that can go down. So, you know, genomics has a huge role to play in the treatment. Just as PARP inhibitors have shown, there are more and more therapeutic, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, pharmaceutical agencies that have been, that have been looked at and is currently under research. Okay. Thank you so much. And Dr. Nija, there's one more question which says that, is there gene therapy for sickle cell anemia available? Not yet. We don't, but that is one of the diseases that has been looked at, including Duchenne muscular dystrophy. These are all under research. There may be clinical trials, but we don't have anything actively in the market as of yet. Okay. And I want to ask one question related to that. Like you told about the monogenic and polygenic diseases, right? So I, I assume that it's easier to find a way out for the monogenic diseases than a polygenic. Is it so? Like to find a cure for these diseases if you have a monogenic uh, Yes, disease? obviously monogenic is easier. Yes, yes. So a lot of the polygenic disorders, they, we may not have a cure, like type 2 diabetes, cholesterol, blood pressure, obesity. We don't have a cure. It's more about the management and the management really diff is, is based on your lifestyle dietary factors because you know it's a multifactorial disease as compared to monogenic diseases, which are difficult to cure, but there is a more sustained path and you know that there is one gene that you have to look at. So it's easier that way, but monogen polygenic diseases are, um, are more complex from the genetic perspective. And also there is a huge influence. It's, I always see polygenic disease to be a jigsaw puzzle, where in genetics is one piece of that puzzle. You have other pieces, which is your family history, your diet, your lifestyle, um, and your age. So those pieces, are the things that we right now try to manage while we cannot change the genetics. We learn about the genetics. We have ways to understand whether you have a genetic predisposition to it. Um, 
and knowing that predisposition will actually help you modulate the rest of the factors before you develop the disease itself right so the genetic engineers won't go for a polygenic disease cure uh, search they'll be more interested in the monogenic disease cure yes i think i think so i think so because a polygenic is much more tougher to deal with because there are so many factors and you cannot really change everything by monogenic disorders there is a clear pathway that you are looking at that you want to uh, identify an attack and then try and find a cure Okay, I think uh, there are no such more questions. Yeah. So general uh, thing is they are telling it's a very informative and nice talk. So. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Yes, thank you for the platform. Thank you very much uh, for thank giving you. me the platform to uh, be able to talk about this very interesting topic for myself. Yeah. Thank you so much, Doctor Neeja. So, so for all the snippets which you have given. Now next time we are when we are whenever we are going to eat a banana. will feel 50% <laughs> plus 50% it is something else correct absolutely <laughs> yes all right thanks everyone thank, thank you, you so much thank you so much it's it was pleasure. nice having you with us thank you thank you bye bye so with this i hand over the session uh, for the next talk to seema Thank you so much, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. The Nobel Prize for the Year 2022 in Physics was received by Alien Aspect, John Pelosius, Anton Zeeling for entangled protein experiments proving the violation of Bell inequalities and developing the field of quantum information science. And it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome our today's second speaker, Dr. P. C. Deshmukh. Professor Deshmukh has completed his B.Sc., M.Sc., and Ph.D. from nagpur university nagpur maharashtra india professor deshmukh's area of interest is photo absorption process in free or confined atoms molecules and ions dr deshmukh is currently working as a professor at iit tirupati and is a visiting faculty at dayanand sagar university college of pharmaceutical sciences dayanand sagar university welcome professor deshmukh now i request professor deshmukh to take over the session So in the meanwhile, if you uh, guys have any questions, please post it in the chat box. We will be answering your question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Seema. Hello. Ah uh, yes, you are audible, sir. Yes, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be here this evening. and i'm sharing my screen now i hope it is visible is it yes sir it is visible yes okay. it's visible all right very nice so um, it it is really wonderful to be here on this uh, platform of the college of pharmaceutical sciences of the dayanand sagar university and uh, being a part of the dayanand sagar university family it gives me even more joy to be here with all of you this evening and coming after a very fascinating talk on the nobel prize in medicine uh, discovering uh, our uh, relations with neanderthals and denisovans i was reminded of uh, a remark which i heard some time back that god gave us our relatives thank god we can choose our friends so Uh, from one mind-boggling topic to another today and it is particularly interesting that uh, this topic is on quantum entanglement and the nobel prize given for the understanding of quantum entanglement and the revolutionary areas it is opening up in co using quantum computation and quantum technologies and particularly in the field of drug design and medical sciences we are all confronted with making choices 
a choice similar to what Arjun perhaps had to make to fight or not to fight. This is the Arjun Vishad, as we know. And we have to make these choices. You're developing a drug and then you make some progress and then you go back to the database and then you have to figure out, do I pick this molecule or do I pick another molecule? And it's always a choice between either this or that. And this is really very interesting. And this is the question which quantum sciences and quantum entanglement really addresses. So let's look at these choices. You have to make a choice between heads and tail, okay? Or to be or not to be. And if you think about a cat in a box, you think about a cat being either dead or alive. And this is all binary, okay? So it's either one or zero, true or false, long or short. And it's either this or that. And this is the basis for a whole mathematical scheme which was developed by George Boole. It's called as Boolean algebra. And this becomes the basic tool to do any kind of computation because you have to make a choice. You have to find what is the smallest number in a set of numbers. Then you start making comparison and then you, know, you decide if it is smaller or bigger and so on. And then depending on the answer you proceed, and you can arrange them in a certain order if you wish. And Claude Shannon, he he's sometimes regarded as one of the foremost contributors to information sciences. Uh, he recognized that using these electrical switches, which are either on or off, you can simulate these two states, yes or no, or true or false, into electrical circuits. And then you build various gates, which you might have read about, to operate upon these signals. And that is how you do computing. This is called as classical computing. And this is classical because uh, even if it uses quantum devices, like semiconductors are quantum devices and semiconductors are used in computers, but the methodology is still, the mathematics which is employed in this is still classical, it is binary. And then Richard Feynman in the early 1980s, he said that if you are to do computing, it would be wonderful if you do it according to the laws of nature which are not really fully explicable by classical physics, except in an approximate manner. And you really need quantum theory to account for the laws of nature. So what exactly is this? And I will begin with a discussion on this. So here is a picture of a bed of sand and the sand can fall through these two gaps. Do you see these gaps? Do you see the cursor, everybody? Yes? Can somebody yes, tell yes, me? Yes, 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 right, we, we do, we do. Yeah, thank you. So if this sand is falling through these gaps, you expect the sand to form two heaps over here. However, Thomas Young, who was a polymath and in the, he, he showed that if you do such an experiment with light and you shine light on this side and let it go through two gaps, then instead of two heaps, you see this pattern, which are fringes, areas of dark and bright fringes. So they come in, <coughs> you have alternative regions of high intensity, and no intensity, which is really mind boggling. It is a counterintuitive if you just compare it with what you expect from sand. 
then if you do, do this experiment either with light or the same result comes if you uh, do this experiment also with electrons or any other particles, you get this alternate dark and bright fringes. This is an interference pattern. And what is interesting about it is that instead of these two heaps, when you get this interference pattern, you can account for it only by making an alternative assumption for your theory. And this alternative is very counterintuitive. You have to think about the light falling, not just from one slit or the other slit, but possibly from both. So this is really interesting that light must be considered, or even if it is electrons, you can do this experiment with electrons, you can do this with light. And in either case, you get this interference pattern, which you see at the bottom. So this is very strange. And this is why quantum theory is considered to be counterintuitive. Now, if you're confused, you wonder whether light has gone through slit one or slit two, you decide to spy on that. You do some other experiment, you shine, you send some other particles behind the slit. And then you ask, by doing such an experiment, by modifying this apparatus, I can figure out from where the light would have passed through or the electron would have passed through. And when you do this, this is called as a which way experiment. And in a which way experiment, as soon as you attempt a which way experiment, the interference pattern disappears. So here you have the interference pattern when you do not know from which slit the particle has passed through. But if you make an attempt to find from which slit the particle has passed through, you do a which way experiment, then the interference pattern disappears. And this is really spooky. Now it gets even spookier because if you now put a lens here and the lens would bring into focus the two rays which are coming from behind the two slits. So the information about the which way experiment is now erased. This is called as a quantum eraser. And if you erase this information, then the interference pattern reappears. Now, by doing something over here, how does the particle figure out whether it is supposed to be going from only one slit or from both? Well, this is a mind boggling question. And the only way to understand it is not to worry about what the particle thinks because it's not the particle which thinks, it is us who think. And our task is to describe the results of this experiment. And this experiment can be described by a new theory, which is quantum physics. And it is a mind boggling theory because when you have a which way eraser, then the interference pattern reappears. Now it gets even spookier because if you keep this lens far away, means now you see that it is between this black line and this red line, which is where your having the detector. But if you move this lens further down, further down, I hope you're seeing the cursor, you take it away well beyond the range of the apparatus and take it outside the apparatus, what we think about outside. So what is inside and outside are two regions of space which are in our mind. And we now describe, we position this lens in a region which is outside the apparatus. But wherever you keep it, it has the same effect. Now, if you keep this lens far away, you still have a quantum eraser. And what it does is to restore the interference. So it's really very spooky. Now, look at this experiment. It's a similar experiment, except that we now have multiple scatterers over here so that the light can pass from here. It passes through this hole, then through this hole but then it gets scattered over here and get, 
gets scattered once again over here and it can go through zigzag paths. And quantum mechanics gives you the correct account, correct description of the interference that you see at the detector only when you consider all of these alternative paths, no matter how mind boggling they are and how zigzag they are. They may go through these multiple loops, but you must take them into account. If you do not take them into account, you do not get the correct description of interference that you see at, at the detector. Now, even spoke here. Let's consider these obstacles to be very far away. We consider this obstacle to be on Mars and this in the Andromeda galaxy, two and a half million light years away. And here you are doing an experiment in your lab from the source to the screen is just a couple of meters. And here light would take like two and a half million years to go there and come back. But you still must take that into account to, if you want to describe the pattern, interference pattern correctly. And you might wonder at what speed would these particles have to travel? But it turns out that you don't even worry about the speed of the particle because speed and momentum are proportional to each other. If you know the path, you know that it has gone on this path, you know its positions and positions and momenta are not knowable simultaneously because you try to make a measurement of position, you disturb the momentum and vice versa. This is called as a Heisenberg microscope. And the principle that we just enunciated is referred to as the Heisenberg principle of uncertainty. If you know the position, you cannot know the momentum. So you don't even ask this question. It is not the right question to be asked. And this is what Niels Bohr once explained that quantum mechanics does not answer all the questions, but it tells you what are the right questions to be asked. So this is, the mind-boggling theory of nature. And it is not correct to say that quantum mechanics is mind-boggling. What is mind-boggling is nature and quantum mechanics describes it correctly, okay? What makes quantum theory mind-boggling is not the theory itself, but nature. Nature manifests herself in ways which are mysterious and we cannot take those into account properly using what we think are our intuitive ideas. You need a new theory and this theory turns out to be highly mathematical. You need a mathematical vector space, which is called as a Hilbert space. You represent physical systems by vectors in a Hilbert space and so on. And you develop a whole algebra of vector space. And what makes mathematics so powerful in describing nature is a gift, which Wigner said, we neither understand nor deserve, but it works and nothing succeeds like success. So quantum theory gives you the correct description of nature. The theory is strange, not because of any uh, complicated set of minds which created this theory, but because nature manifests herself in a very mysterious manner, in a very strange manner, and quantum theory gives you the correct account of that. And in this theory, you cannot represent the state of a system by our old classical ideas, like what is position, what is momentum, and so on. Those ideas do not work. They are not compatible with each other. They are intrinsically inconsistent. So you need to represent the state of a system by a vector in the Hilbert space. And this is the mathematical formulation which you need to work with. And you represent the state vector in arbitrary state vector as a linear superposition of certain base vectors, eigenvectors, with certain coefficients, which in general are complex numbers. And the probability that this system is in a particular state is given by the modulus square of this probability. Now, this is what makes 
the laws of nature intrinsically probabilistic. This is the correct description of nature and it involves probabilistic distribution. Now, this is again strange because physicists were used to a deterministic understanding of the laws of nature. A cause determines the effect. There is no question of uncertainty. There is no question of probability. If you know the cause, then this is what is bound to happen. That is the determinism that physics was used to. And you see that probability now becomes an intrinsic part of nature. And this is the reality check because what it challenged was our perception of reality. And this is a picture of the famous 1927 conference at Solvay. And these questions were debated by Einstein and Bohr at this conference. And the debate sort of continued for many years. And there were important papers by Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen, and also by Niels Bohr. So this is part of the famous Bohr-Einstein debate. Means This is a wonderful photograph in which anybody who was anybody is found in this picture. So here is probability. It's not that probability is new to physics or to mankind. Means you, you throw a dice and whether you will get phase one or phase two or phase three, there is an element of chance. Or here, if you go to a casino and you turn this spinning wheel and wherever it would stop, will determine whether you will become a millionaire or a pauper. Or you are at a cricket match and you toss a coin and you do not know if it is heads or tail. And again, as I said earlier, that you're always at a crossroad, you have to make a choice to fight or not to fight, to be or not to be. Here, the choice is heads or tail. And whatever it turns out, once again, you will have to make a choice. Are you going to bat first or are you going to bowl first? So all of these questions boil down to this or that, slit one or slit two. And what quantum mechanics is doing is it builds a theory in which you accommodate the possibility of a particle going both from slit one and slit two. It's not either slit one or slit two. It is not either heads or tail. It's not either a cat being dead or alive, but it is going through both. But that is what gives you the correct description of the interference pattern that you see in the Young's double slit experiment. So probability is there in classical physics also. We see it in these pictures over here. And the entire classical physics, the classical statistics, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution inclusive is based on probability. But there is one thing in this. This probability is coming not because of any intrinsic properties of nature, but because there is some lack of information that we have. It is the information shortage. For example, when you take the spinning wheel and you turn it, if you know exactly what is the force you have applied, what is the friction, if you knew all of this, you can actually predict where exactly it will stop. And the reason you are not able to predict it is because these are the hidden variables in your understanding. This information is missing. And this is what prompted Einstein to raise the question that, okay, quantum physics gives you a probabilistic description of nature, but is it because of hidden variables? And that possibility could not be ruled out. So the Bohr-Einstein debates were about this. And here is a marvelous experiment, which is paradoxical, which was proposed by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. This is a famous paper of 1935. And um, it's really amazing that everything seems to begin with Einstein. And what Einstein proposed, 
and the actual details of the experiment are quite intricate, but I will give you a toy illustration of their reasoning that if you have a fission over here and one particle moves to the right and the other moves to the left, then you can measure the position of this particle and measure the momentum of the red particle, measure the position of the blue and momentum of the red. So you're not measuring the position and momentum of the same particles. And then from symmetry and conservation of momentum, you can get information about position and momentum of both the particles. And if you can do that, then what would happen to the position momentum uncertainty is a question. Now, Einstein, of course, knew that the position momentum uncertainty in quantum mechanics was working. It gave correct results in atomic physics. And if there were to be position momentum uncertainty, despite these conservation principles, then it can only be because of some hidden variables which are there, which we do not know yet. And that led Einstein to propose that quantum theory is correct, but it is incomplete. So these models are, this is the description of reality and this Nobel Prize, this that we are talking about is very much connected with our understanding of what is reality. And the reality as was known at that time is described by Einstein and this line is straight from his paper in which Einstein points out that a sufficient condition for the reality of a physical quantity is the possibility of predicting it with certainty without disturbing the system. So if you're measuring, if you, it, it is like suggesting that the blue particle has a momentum. I'm not measuring it, but it has it. I may not measure it. If measurement is a problem, then let me measure only the position of the blue particle. But it still has a momentum that I can talk about. It is a part of the reality that I can talk about. So this was the description of reality. And such theories are called as theories which belong to what is called as counterfactual definiteness. What it means is that a property that you measure is a part of your reality, but also a property which you have not measured. And Einstein actually dramatized this by asking, is the moon there if you're not looking at it? So you believe that there is a certain property which the system has, even if you're not measuring it. So now Bohr countered Einstein's arguments. And this is another paper by Bohr with the same title. Can quantum mechanical description of physical reality be considered complete? This was the title of Einstein's paper. And Bohr responded with a paper with the same title. And he showed certain fallacies in Einstein's arguments and argued that the conclusion that Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen had arrived at, that quantum mechanics is incomplete, was not justified. However, there was no neat way of trying to figure out what is the nature of probability? What is the understanding of reality? and in a counterfactual definite theory. So this took a long time. And the argument which Einstein had advanced that there must be hidden variables, which is what makes quantum theory incomplete. This possibility is something which could not be ruled out. And Einstein, in fact, argued that maybe in the future, one would figure out how to identify these hidden variables or what these hidden variables are. And then the uncertainties in quantum theory would be eliminated and classical physics would be recovered. That was Einstein's hope. However, it took th almost 30 years in the mid sixties that John Bell came up with a very neat way of resolving this issue. And what he figured out that the way quantum theory is built, it would not account 
for any uncertainties through hidden variables. So we will see the basis of John Bell's arguments. So let's look at this uncertainty. When you spin a coin, and there is a chance that you will get heads or tails. Suppose you start looking at correlations in the outcome of this experiment. So you have got three matches going on simultaneously and one match in which you have Smriti Mandana and another Rohit Sharma is there in another one. And you can ask this question, what are the correlations in the results of the outcome of the toss? Is there any correlation that Rohit Sharma will get heads when Smriti Mandana gets heads? Is there any correlation between Mahendra Dhoni getting tails when Rohit Sharma gets heads? These are the questions that you can ask. And mind you, here, the uncertainty is coming because of the hidden variables, because you do not know exactly how much force you have applied on the coin. If you know exactly how much force you have applied on the coin, what is the torque on it? How is it spinning? What is the friction in the air that the coin would meet? What is the density of air? What is the humidity in the air? These are the hidden variables. And if you put all of this information together, you can actually predict whether the coin would fall on heads or tails. Now, is the uncertainty in quantum mechanics similar to this? So let's see how this would work. So let's look at these three uh, tosses, and I'm going to label them as red, green, and blue. And then on the next slide, I have again this red, blue, and green regions, and I have three circles over here in the same colors. And if you look at various sections of the circle, each section is double valued in two ways. The red may overlap with green or it may not. Also, the red may overlap with blue or it may not. And this is the kind of correlation that you would ask whether Smriti Vandana gets heads and Rohit Sharma also heads, gets heads or does he get tails? So it's similar to that. And if you look at these sections, there are a total of seven sections over here. And now what you're going to do is to play a child's game. You know the game of pinning the nose. So there is a cartoon picture and you are blindfolded and you are given a pin and you're supposed to pin the nose. Okay. So when you are blindfolded, you would pin it somewhere on the face. And it could be anywhere. It could be on the ear or some part of the forehead or anywhere. And we ask, what is the chance that you pin in the region one or two or three or four or five or six or seven? These are the seven sections. And if you look at the probabilities, then it is very easy to see from this figure that these probabilities will satisfy this inequality that green, not blue, plus blue, not red, this probability is greater than or equal to green, not red. And this is the kind of inequality that the Bell's inequality is about. So this is the kind of inequality which must be satisfied. In those theories, where you have counterfactual definiteness and the uncertainties are coming, from local hidden variables. The reason is, if you look at green not blue plus blue not red, green not blue will also include green not blue with red and green not blue without red. So this is the counterfactual definiteness property that is popping up. That when you talk about green not blue, you're not talking, you're not asking whether it overlaps with red or it does not overlap with red. But we know that that property exists. It is a property whose reality is a part of your thinking 
irrespective of whether or not you measure it. So this is the argument which goes into it. And what Bell said that the Bell's theorem is so important. The Bell's inequality is so important because he gives you a mathematical way of testing your interpretation of reality. That a theory which allows you to do this test. It is a mathematical inequality that you can actually test this and ask that if you have a theory which confirms to counterfactual definiteness and local reality, and if there is hidden variable in the theory, then this inequality must be satisfied. And this is a marvelous paper by John Bell in 1964. The title is On the einstein podolsky rosen Paradox. This is considered to be one of the greatest contributions to human thought. So you can actually do this experiment now. And these are the experiments which have been carried out by uh, Jean Clauser and uh, um, Alan Aspe and um, Anton Zeilinger. So those experiments are again very involved, very challenging. They involve high precision measurements, very sophisticated planning. But the idea is very simple. And I will refer only to the central idea that if you have a singlet pair of spin half particles and they fly away, and one is measured by Alice on one side and by Bob on the other, but you can carry out measurements in an apparatus which is called as the Stern Gulreich apparatus. And in this Stern Gulreich apparatus, you can have an axis of quantization which is either along the horizontal like what you see in the picture red or the blue like the vertical which is in the frame blue or the diagonal at 45 degrees which is in the frame green so this is similar to looking at correlations between the three games mahindra singh dhoni smriti mandana and rohit sharma or the three circles which overlapped each other and what is analogous to getting heads or tail is whether the measurements of Alice and Bob give you spin up or spin down. And if the theory is in conformity with what is expected from the Bell's inequality, then it would be accounted for by local hidden variables, not otherwise. So these are splendid experiments which have been carried out. And if you look at these experiments here, we must recognize the fact that the probabilities of an observer on the left and an observer on the right getting either spin up or spin down are determined by the modulus square of this coefficient and there is no way you can avoid this mathematics. So this is what makes quantum theory a mathematical theory of nature. And here the probabilities are coming not from hidden variables, not from any information which is missing, but from the modulus square of these coefficients which in general are complex numbers. And the origin of probability is completely different, which is why the Bell's inequality is not satisfied. And this is what the experiments of Jean Clauser, uh, Alan Aspect, and Zeilinger uh, show that the Bell's inequality is violated. And if you read the citation of this year's Nobel Prize, you will see that they actually showed that the Bell's inequalities are violated. And John Bell's conclusion was that, um, his suggestion was that the inequality must be satisfied by all theories that are both local and counterfactual. And since in experiments, quantum correlations violate this inequality, you are led to the conclusion that quantum theory is either non-counterfactual or non-local. 
And the idea of non-locality is really mind-boggling. Because you keep kept wondering, has the particle gone through slit one or slit two? And you have to talk about both the possibilities, which really makes it non-local. And unless you do that, you cannot account for the Young's double slit experiment. So it is there right in the original understanding of quantum mechanics in the 1920s and 30s. And um, uh, these experiments actually showed, but it becomes even more interesting. And the reason uh, for the Nobel Prize is also not just the, for the understanding of the uh, violation of Bell's inequality in quantum experiments, but also because Zeilinger's work lays down the foundation for quantum information science and quantum computing, which is why it is described as the most profound discovery of science. So this, what makes it so powerful and important for quantum computing, which allows you to do mathematics, not just with zero or one, a switch being on or off, but by a combination of the switch being in a state of both being on and being off. It's like the Young's double slit experiment in which the particle would enter through both slit one and slit two, or the cat being both dead and alive. So this is a very mind boggling idea, but this is exactly what has been established by the experiments of um, Jean Cloiser and Aspe and uh, Zeilinger. And it has revolutionized many things. There are many technologies which are coming as a result of this, which will impact cybersecurity, quantum networks, optimization problems. And these of course are important even for drug design and medicine and so on. So it's something which brings together the whole of humanity together. And what makes it very powerful is this idea of quantum teleportation, which was demonstrated in Zeilinger's work. And that is the work which, for which he has been awarded the Nobel Prize. And what teleportation is about can be understood by looking at this superposition of zero and one. You have a superposition of zero and one. It's like a particle going both through slit one and slit two. So what are exclusive alternatives become inclusive in this statement. And you must include both the opposite, the switch being on and off together. And here is a piece of information. This is quantum information because it is a superposition of these two. If you do a which way experiment, you try to find has it gone through slit one or slit two, the interference pattern disappears, which means that the system collapses into an eigenstate as it is called. And Alice therefore cannot send this information, cannot communicate this information to Bob because if she were to do any experiment on this, it would be like performing a which way experiment and the system would collapse into an eigenstate. So she has to communicate this information without measurement. And what she makes use of is quantum entanglement. So what they have is they have two other qubits which are superpositions of zero and one. So there are like two other cats which are in a state of being dead or alive, and they are in an entangled state. And what this means is that the physical state of the combined system A and B cannot be written as a product of state A and state B. So this is called as the state not being factorable. This is called as a Bell state or an entangled state. And you have, Alice and Bob have this resource with them. They have two qubits in an entangled state. And what Alice now does is that she entangles this qubit with this. So when she does that, it is like, you know, carrying out an experiment on this qubit 
which is entangled with this. But since this qubit is entangled with this, the information becomes available to Bob and he can figure out this unknown state of superposition which Alice originally had. This is teleportation. Nothing is traveling. But this is entanglement. It is spooky, but there is no travel because travel involves going from point A to point B. You start at time T1 and reach at a time T2. That is travel. Here, entanglement is a state in which the two qubits exist all the time, regardless of the distance between them. Which means that the distinction between here and there disappears. That is a non-locality. So the information has not traveled from here to there, which is sometimes it raises questions about how does information travel at a speed faster than, the, than light if it is going instantly. It's not traveling, my dear. It is just there. It is there between these two qubits. These two qubits are entangled. What has changed is your perception of here and there. There is no difference between here and there. Nature manifests herself in a strange way. Quantum theory is not strange. Nature is strange. Quantum theory describes it correctly. And quantum theory describes it correctly by accommodating a mathematical structure, which is the algebra of Hilbert space, which is the recognition of the position, momentum, and certainty, and developing a probabilistic theory based on this. So this is the outcome of the work of Jean Kleiser, Aspect, and Zeilinger. There is no question about any information traveling at a speed greater than the speed of light because the information is just there. It is the breakdown of our intuitive idea of locality. What we considered to be local was not the way in which nature exhibits herself. So nature is strange. Quantum theory is correct. And this is the outcome of these experiments. So it is spooky, but there is no travel. And this is what I like to call as reality 2.0. That what we think is local has a non-local attribute when the qubits are entangled. Of course, qubits which are not entangled do not subscribe to this. So it's only entangled qubits. But then when you can get a large number of qubits entangled, then you can get correlated processing of information, which is quantum information. And this is how quantum computers work. This is how you can benefit in drug design because you can process a lot of information together. You don't have to work with zero and one separately, one at a time. It's not like going from here to some point and then decide, that at the next junction, do you take a left turn or a right turn? And then you take a left turn and then go further and then again decide whether you will take a left turn or a right turn. Here, you're processing all of that information together in one go, which is the power of quantum computing. So this is so remarkable that it is not surprising that Aspe, Clauser, and Zeilinger have been awarded with the Nobel Prize. And um, John Bell certainly would have been awarded a Nobel Prize as well, but unfortunately he died somewhat uh, unexpectedly. Um, but that's a different story. Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you so much, sir, for this informative uh, session. So uh, it was very helpful for us to know about the quantum theory based on the seed and deep experiment, electron gum experiment, and uh, also about the EPR 1935. And it was very interesting uh, to see the RP, RPG theory 
uh, like giving examples about the famous cricketers of our country. Really, it was a very informative session. And uh, we have some questions in the chat box. So I'll sure. just read it for you. Sure. Uh, do entangled particles travel faster than the light? No. Entangled particles no, travel no, faster no, than the light? No, no, no. That is the answer. <laughs> okay. And, uh, <laughs> that is the answer. They, yeah. um, th that is very well understood. That is uh, part of, um, you know, that, that that's something which comes straight out of uh, Maxwell's electrodynamics and um, Maxwell's theory, Maxwell's electromagnetic theory uh, leads you to the understanding of the speed of light being an ultimate speed beyond which it is not possible to accelerate any particle, any material particle. Uh, that is because of the nature <clears throat> of space and time uh, which belong to a flat space-time non-Euclidean space. So nothing travels faster than light. And uh, one question we have is, can entanglement be related to wormholes? It is possible. <laughs> it has not been firmly established as yet, but it is speculated. And uh, it is, uh, it, there may be a connection, but I think uh, people are still working on this idea. Um, there are many similarities between how entangled qubits manifest their shared information and how information could go through a wormhole. Uh, there are some similarities, but I don't think that it has been firmly established as yet. There are similarities and one might uh, speculate on that, but it's not something which is firmly established as yet. And the one last question we have, sir. Uh, what are the applications of this uh, research that is the quantum in drug discovery? Well, I, I we talked about, you know, making choices. The Arjuna Vishad with which I started to fight or not to fight. And you make these choices in drug discovery all the time. When, when you talk about, you know, coming up with a drug, uh, you have an alternative databases. Do I refer to this database or the other one? Do I use this molecule to attack a particular, uh, you know, position in a virus? Or do I try a different molecule? So all the time, you have to make a choice about this or that. You have to make a choice between slit one and slit two of the Young's double slit experiment. And what quantum entanglement allows you to do is to process both the choices together. Now look at the power you now have in drug discovery. Because instead of making one choice and then see what it leads you to, you can process the information for both the choices. And you can do it in one go. So definitely drug discovery will be very much assisted by quantum computing because quantum computing allows you to process the two alternatives together. So that gives you an enormous power. And uh, you are well aware as to, you know, how expensive it is to develop a drug, how much time it takes to develop a drug. It takes many years and maybe millions or billions of dollars. But then if you process these alternatives through the algebra, of entangled qubits, which simulate your alternatives, then you have a much more effective way leading to drug discovery. So certainly in this, artificial intelligence would also play a role, but here I'm focusing on the power you get through entanglement. Thank you, sir. 
because entanglement gives you the power, the capability to process the alternatives in one go. And uh, one more question we have, sir. Uh, like, yes. what is the importance of uh, the Bell's theorem? Bell's theorem is, um, I mentioned that it is, uh, it has been applauded as the most important scientific discovery by, um, I, I quoted this a little while ago. I mean, look at it this way. Here were two intellectual giants, Niels Bohr and Albert Einstein, engaged in a debate. And the debate was, what is the nature of probability? That yes, there is uncertainty in quantum mechanics. That is something which was acknowledged by both. But what is the nature of this uncertainty? Where is the probability coming from? Is it coming from hidden variables? Is it coming from the hidden variables as I talked about in the toss of a coin? And although there were arguments on both sides by Einstein and Bohr, there was no way of figuring out what is the nature of this uncertainty. And this is the importance of John Bell's work because he came up with a mathematical inequality that if, if at all the correlations in, and, and uncertainties are because of hidden variables in a counterfactual definite theory, then a certain inequality must be satisfied. So you can actually perform a test and measure these correlations. And if your experiments show that this inequality is violated, then you can conclude that the uncertainties, the probabilities, probabilities are not originating from hidden variables. So he showed conclusively a way of testing whether the uncertainty in quantum theory was due to hidden variables or not. So Bohr gave strong arguments against Einstein, but he did not have a way of actually determining what kind of experiment should be done so that you can actually ask that if you have counterfactual definiteness in uh, a, a theory which, uh, in which local reality plays a big role, then is that theory correct? That could be done only after John Bell's work, which is why it is of such great importance. And it also makes the experiments of Aspe Clauser and Zeilinger so important because these experiments showed that the Bell's inequalities are violated. Yes? Thank you so much, sir. And now I request all the participants to fill the feedback form. The link has been shared in the chat box. So we have one more question actually. Yes. Uh, how the angle can be measured? How? The angle. Angle? Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, I, I, I don't think it uh, means uh, this can be answered in many different ways. Um, but I don't think that is uh, of interest to the topic and the discussion today. They have asked with respect to the arbitrary motion. No, I, I think the question needs to be better framed. Oh, okay, sir, fine. Uh, I will be uh, very happy to answer this question. Yes. Uh, whoever has asked this question, uh, I request that she or he reformulates this question, sends it to me by email, and I will be very happy to respond to it. Sure. Uh, it is not clear to me as to what uh, the question is really about, because you know arbitrary motion angles means I think I think these are um, one can interpret this in many different ways, and it is not clear to me what the question is. So please reformulate this question in a precise manner and send it to me. I will be very happy to answer. Sure, sure, sure. 
Thank you okay. so much. Sure. Sir. Yes. I now request Dr. Nandini to propose the closing. Well, thank you very much for uh, the wonderful opportunity to be a part of this uh, event. It's a wonderful initiative uh, taken by your uh, College of Pharmaceutical Sciences. So I really want to thank uh, Dr. Raghavendra and um, uh, Dr. Seema, everybody, uh, for a wonderful opportunity. Professor, Professor the Deshmukh, I'm really thankful to you for accepting to deliver such a wonderful and awesome presentation with lots of images and self-explanatory uh, slides. And I'm also, uh, you know, humbled to see you have connected many of these equations to our uh, Vedic sciences and you know, mythological uh, diagrams. Uh, no, I don't think I did that. I don't think I did no, that. No, some, some, some images were there. <laughs> yeah, so uh, th those were... Yeah for, yeah, for 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 a different purpose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was only in the context of uh, talking about the choices, yes or no. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Arjun Vishad. Yeah. Uh, may I fight or may I not fight? So <laughs> so here I'm only referring to yeah. you're getting either a head or a tail or a particle going through slit one or slit two. So nothing beyond it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Before we end the session, I would like to thank the speakers of the day, Dr. Neeraja Reddy and Professor P.C. Deshmukh for accepting our invitation in their busy schedule. I thank Dr. Pushpa Sarkar, Dean School of Health Sciences, BSU, Dr. N.M. Raghavendra, Principal Corps, BSU, and staff of College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Dhanan Sagar University. I also thank all the participants who attended this session and made this session successful. Thank you all once again. Participants can fill up the feedback forms posted in the chat box. You will receive the participant certificate on the submission of your feedback forms. See you soon for next session of lecturer series on Nobel Prize 2022 on December 9, sharp at 6.50 p.m. Thank you all. Goodbye. Bye, sir. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. I think uh, I, I should also thank our own team for such a wonderful synergy amongst all of us. All of us can come on screen now. Mr. Utkarsh is asking uh, for an email ID of Professor Deshmukh. We will definitely send it. So thanks to all of you, <clears throat> and it was a you know uh, I was little really you know uh, worried as how things will happen, and uh, because this is the first thing for me at COPS, and it turned out to be very very uh, professional way of execution. Thanks to everyone. Thanks, to you. Thank, thank you. you thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all Maybe. the participants. Sir, please join back in the next session. So two minutes, sir. We'll take this thing. And then if I have taken. <laughs> all right, all right. Let thank me you. take one more, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Bye bye. Good night. See you tomorrow. Good night, sir. Bye. Okay. Good night. Thank sir. you all the participants. Thank, thank you all.